from CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. As France gets ready for the presidential elections on Sunday, there are already two frontrunners. Will President Emmanuel Macron remain in the Elysee Palace for a second term? Or will France get its first woman president in Marie Le Pen? Is the Ukraine situation a decisive factor for voters? And how will the election results impact Europe and NATO? Joining us in the conversation is Joe Ruet from Paris at the heart of the action. He's also the chairman of the think tank Bridge Tank from Berlin, Germany. We have Dr. Thorsten. Good evening, good morning. Thorsten Jelenik, a senior fellow and European director at the Taihe Institute, a think tank based in Beijing, China. And also we have with us in eastern China's Zhejiang province, Song Xin, former policy advisor at the European Parliament. Currently, she's the global affairs consultant at Joe and Masters, a management consultancy. Uh, before I go to our experts, I want to brief our audience about uh, the candidates themselves. There are so far 12 candidates in this French presidential elections, eight men, four women. It is a wide spectrum, to say the least, including the sitting president, of course, the mayor of Paris, an ex-teacher, a former shepherd turned MP. Um, if there's no clear winner on Sunday, a runoff election will be held between the top two winners on April the 24th. Five years ago, we all remember Macron defeated far-right leader Marie Le Pen by a very narrow margin. So, Joe, let me go to you first. Uh, this time around, do you see history repeating itself? Could that be a, a runoff between Le Pen and Macron? Well, it could uh, and it might not at the same time. You know, polls are only polls. Uh, especially we have a rule to stop polling a few days before the election. So you mentioned Marine Le Pen, who's according to, some, to many polls is coming second after the voting intention for President Macron. But don't forget there's Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Jean-Luc Mélenchon is a seasoned uh, politician uh, from the left wing. He's in a narrow distance from Marine Le Pen. Five years ago, he uh, missed being on the second round of the election by just a few thousands of votes. So we stand within the margin of error uh, of what are the polls, you know. So this, this scenario is still to be considered. Now, what is important is that you're right. We're making history in a sense where we see that the classical left-wing parties and the classical right-wing parties seem to have nearly disappeared from the intentions of votes. Okay, uh, Thorsten, how do you look at the state of the campaign? What's your rating on it? Well, you know, we've been in uh, fact, so Thorsten, actually, the if I can go to you, Thorsten. Uh, I think, Joe, uh, I have uh, we... there. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, and now I can just echo the words um, uh, that we have uh, actually only one dark horse coming up here. Uh, which is the veteran leftist uh, Mélenchon, uh, and he is uh, he he came basically uh, out of the ashes, if you wish, as the third time uh, they're meeting in the campaign uh, with Marie Le against Marine Le Pen, and um, and I think it seems he's uh, he's a little bit more moderate in terms, so he has classical you know social democratic socialist um, um, uh, values he's campaigning for, more equality. Uh, he has also climate to attract the younger people. Uh, he even attracted Medev, the, uh, the leading uh, industrial association in France. So, uh, so that's the one who, who is, uh, I think, who, who, who has some probability. But uh, I also think uh, that uh, it's less likely that he will make uh, to the second round. Okay, um, Madam Songxing, what do you think? Uh, will there be any black horses? Well, uh, to be honest, I think. Well, the second um, round will be really tricky because uh, in 2015, when we had this Brexit uh, referendum, and we also uh, thought that um, there might be a slight winning from this stay camp. But in the end, it was, the, um, it was exactly the opposite um, scenario because a lot of people think, you know, uh, si since the, uh, most of the people will vote to stay, then my vote probably will not count and I want to use my vote to punish actually uh, the, uh, the European institution and in the end the more people think about this and uh, the more it will actually reverse the, the final result so the second round um, this year can be really really 
really tricky. But uh, what indications or indicators did you pick up? Uh, which side could uh, you know, uh, the results swing, um, to Le Pen or to Macron, maybe? Oh, I, I mean, actually, Le Pen. Because a lot of people think that the others uh, will um, pick up, actually, the instructions of uh, their um, previous, actually, candidate, and they will vote for Macron. And then they will think, probably, I can use my vote for, uh, to vote for Le Pen. And, but this kind of thinking might affect, actually, the final result. Yeah, uh, complacency can be bad sometimes. Um, Joe, what do you think? I mean, the 2022 presidential election seems to be a contest between centrists, uh, represented by Macron, of course, and also by the far right and far left leaders. Um, how do they become a, a tussle, if you will, between institutionalists and populists in France? Well, first of all, you know, what is very important and which is pretty new in the Fifth Republic, uh, which was started in 1958 in France, is that for the first time you have an incumbent president which stands at a 26% intention vote. Usually, a president who's had a first mandate is eroded. So, sometime, so somehow, the President Macron has consolidated his position. He has, for the first time, created a center. So, don't take this center for, for granted. So, as this is new in French history over the last five years, there are testings on the left and on the right. And as was said, the right is rather far right, but has been uh, kind of um, made smoother by Marine Le Pen. It's not exactly the same Marine Le Pen today as five years ago. And the so-called extreme left is not extreme left. It's the good old social democrat agenda with a bit more emphasis on environment, labor. So, I think the, the political situation is very peculiar. Now, one very important thing is that the system has changed as well. We used to say, there was the saying, that in the first round, we eliminate, you know, we move from 12 odd yeah. candidates to 10, and in the second round, we choose. This time is the reverse. This time, tomorrow, people will choose whom they want to see in the second round, but then they will either fear Marine Le Pen or fear Jean-Luc Mélenchon, and they will try to eliminate them. I don't think that the people who want to eliminate uh, Emmanuel Macron will be so uh, numerous. So I think Emmanuel Macron really stands a good chance. The margin will be narrow, but he should be the next president. Uh, Thurston, do you look at that way too? I mean, voter split is very important for countries who have multiple rounds of elections. Um, which vote, uh, which uh, candidate could the voters who went for other candidates uh, vote for the second round? Well, I, th I agree that, uh, that often you, you take the vote to punish, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the incumbent uh, in, in this way. So I uh, fully agree. I think here when you maybe contrast um, uh, Le Pen and... Um, and Mélenchon, uh, you see that there is a, a, a slight difference also. I mean, uh, Mélenchon is uh, still more ideological, even though he doesn't do a kind of a classical class-based uh, campaign and he's more moderate. But uh, uh, Le Pen here is, um, she is um, uh, probably least ideological in a way. I mean, she is a populist, uh, is, is on the right side, this is obvious. Uh, but uh, you can see it maybe in relation to the Ukraine war uh, that, uh, that, that actually uh, it, it just says it's not our war, uh, whereas, uh, uh, whereas on the left side uh, there is some, uh, you know, still some, um, some not support, but I would say uh, the critique towards the US, towards NATO, uh, the expansion. So there are kind of uh, ideological elements in a classical sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a question how this weighs in, uh, how important it will be for the voters. I think uh, that um, that's remains an unknown uh, for now. Uh, let's talk about the issues. You mentioned uh, Ukraine. Uh, Song Xin, how do you look at the issue of Ukraine and how do you think that has impacted the state of the campaign in France? Actually, the Ukraine crisis reshaped um, the French um, presidential uh, campaign uh, during... Sorry. Song Xin, go ahead, please. Uh, 
uh, during uh, two phases. In the first phase, actually, it in, in enabled uh, President Macron to get more popularities uh, because um, uh, due, uh, due to this um, brutal uh, challenge uh, from Russia and the, Fran the French society was more united behind the current government and to uh, cope with uh, all the challenges. Uh, but during the second phase, um, because of the energy crisis and the sky uh, rocketing inflation, a lot of fears and a lot of concerns start to increase. And that helped uh, Marine Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon to get back uh, more of their uh, potential votes. Because during the first phase, uh, due to their previous remarks about you know, Russia and their, their links with um, uh, Russian President Putin, and they were kind of criticized for their uh, naive uh, foreign uh, policy proposal. But right now, uh, due to this um, inflation problem, and they are gaining back uh, popularities in France. That's why we are seeing a very different, um, uh, they are closing in on Macron like uh, uh, in the latest polls. Yeah, it is a multifaceted issue. Uh, Joe, how do you think uh, President Macron has fared so far? How is he really regarded by the French electorate? Uh, on on, on the Ukraine, Ukraine of course. Policies, you mean? Yeah, you know, I would like to link this Ukraine crisis to your question on populism uh, versus institutionalist. Marine Le Pen, she's a populist. She's populist on any topic, including Ukraine, and she's been switching uh, positions. So she has lost credibility. I think she 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 can't gather the additional votes to become the next president. The way five years ago she had lost credibility on economic matters, this time she has lost enough credibility on diplomatic and, and security matters to become the next president. Jean-Luc Mélenchon is kind of an institutionalist as well. He wants the Sixth Republic and he's very carefully analyzing this situation uh, uh, on Ukraine. Now, back to the Ukraine scenario itself. There have been three phases, I think. The first phase where, despite when, despite there was a brutal war launched by Russia, let's face words, uh, negotiations, diplomacy was attempted. At the European level, pan-European level, and everyone saw that Emmanuel Macron was aligned with the EU leaders and that he acted not just as a French president, but as an acting president of the European Union, which France is chairing for six months. The second phase, I agree with what we've seen. We realize that the, it's not only a war, an illegal war, but it's brutal. Uh, there might even be war crimes that will be qualified in the future. So in this situation, everyone understands that diplomacy has to uh, uh, be based on strength positions. And I think that on that, we'll have a third, a third phase, which will become important in between the two rounds of the election. Here, the timing is very important, where this understanding that we have to balance some disagreements on energy and economy on the one hand, and humanity concerns, humankind concerns, uh, given the brutality of, of, of the action and the kind of butchery that happened. So I think that this will play in favor of Emmanuel Macron, for sure, possibly uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, if he's in the second round, but not Marine Le Pen at all. All righty. Uh, thanks for that analysis. Um, Thurston, how will the Ukraine crisis affect this very crowded field? Uh, for example, Le Pen, had a reportedly had a Russian link in the last election cycle. A Russian bank allegedly gave a loan to her party, but she's still a strong favorite. I think uh, for some, uh, they say, it's, uh, just when we look at the election itself and what the elections are for, uh, there might be a disappointment because it's overshadowed by this horrible war. Uh, uh, here with the far right, I think there is kind of an anti-establishment support linked towards or with Russia and it has financial support as you pointed out. Uh, but I think there is no ideological link in that. It's just, uh, you know, to get some support uh, for that uh, right-wing populist agenda. Uh, whereas on the left, there is an ideological link in the past, of course, with the old uh, communist system, socialist system of the Soviet Union, etc. But latest with that, with that invasion, that ideological link is uh, broken 
and it must be broken for the political left, and not just in France, but uh, throughout Europe uh, and uh, in the West in general. So, so that's more difficult, actually, for the, uh, for the left uh, to uh, uh, re-establish a ideological program uh, that has nothing to do with Russia. And you see uh, with Jean-Luc um, that uh, he basically he uh, opposes that, of course, but uh, still he uh, also legitimately uh, argues against the NATO eastward expansion, so even after, uh, uh, even after the war has started. So for this he has been criticized. So I think for the left that's, uh, it's much more difficult uh, as uh, for Marie Le Pen. As I said uh, initially, that uh, for her it was quite easy. She said, well, that's not our war. So he, he, she makes it a very uh, easy way out of it, of course. Uh, you know, in populism, and that's uh, what I also would like to emphasize, uh, you know, the populism seemed to fade away uh, with the election of Biden. Uh, it was not in the discourse. And now we have it actually back again. But of course, it's, uh, it's in a way overshadowed uh, uh, by the Ukraine war. But it is populism which is a big threat towards Western democracy, towards the democracy uh, in France. And, um, and, uh, and, and this is pretty much associated with, uh, with uh, Marie Le Pen. And you know, the, the populist, what does the populist do? We know the problem, you know, like losing a key in the dark alley on the street, but the populist is searching for the key under the street light. And that's what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And that could uh, play in her cards. Whereas Macron, he wants more sanctions. He, um, he says an electoral shock for the NATO. So, so that, can be, that can be tricky in terms of inflation, uh, uh, energy costs, etc. So I think uh, this is the, the tension we're looking at. Fair enough. Uh, Song Xin, what do you regard as the decisive election issues this year? Last time we know that terrorism was a key factor. Well, apparently it is about national security um, or inflation this year. But deeply, I think it is um, nothing but about the uh, deep feeling of uh, insecurity in France. Uh, because actually, despite the fact that uh, France has a high stand, uh, standard of uh, living and a permanent uh, seat at the UN Security Council, and um, the country still remains the number one tourist destination in the world, the French people uh, perceive their uh, society as a declining power for years. So um, if now national security, immigration, terrorism, or inflation uh, emerged as some major uh, concern, it is mainly because the French people um, uh, are convinced that France is in a continuous decline and hasn't been benefiting from the globalization. And the people feel that their country used to be a big power, uh, but right now is relatively a small one. So therefore, you think France is, um, therefore they think um, France is incapable of coping all this, uh, with all these challenges from the outside. Um, there is a real social um, pessimism in France, uh, let's say. Like French people get, got used to being in a society with very tremendous protections afforded by a very strong centralized uh, state. But since the uh, 1990s and the globalization successive uh, like crisis, um, they have had a feeling that their social and cultural protections are kind of disintegrating and it scares the French people more than it does to people from other um, economically liberal countries. So all the issues such as um, like all, all the decisive like factors that you, uh, you mentioned actually are just to reflect this deep concern like in, in France. Right, all right, thanks for this update. Uh, Joe, I want to ask you about the far right. Uh, how will a far right victory affect Europe? I mean, this, this, is, can, this can be futuristic, but really, uh, how big of a surge do you think the elections can give uh, to the far right? Because we know that four or five years ago in America and across some European societies, the far right was considered the silent majority. Mm. You know, uh, one has to be extremely careful on those matters, on what is, who is far right and how you count. You should not count the second round, because the second round, whoever is on the second round, there's a sense of adjustment, you know, when people vote for all sorts of reasons, not necessarily because they're far right, but because they want to protest or whatever. So what matters is A, the first round of the election, and B, the elections that we'll have in a month from now at the assembly, at the parliament, okay? So if we gather, say, Mrs. Marine Le Pen and Mr. Zemmour, who, who's a far-rightist, 
Zemmour doesn't have a party. So this kind of far right cannot translate into the parliament and cannot translate into a strength, into a political strength. So when it's not a political strength, it's something else. It's a feeling, it's partly a media process which gave ground to, uh, to, to, to someone like Zemmour. So I would be very careful of putting a level at, you know, 30 or 33 percent. I think we are rather close back to the good old 20 percent when of, of far right, where a sizable part of it goes to Zemmour, the other chunk goes to Marine Le Pen, and what adds up to the intentions of vote for Marine Le Pen is not people who are far right, people, there are other people who want to protest, who want to be in the opposition, and as the classical right-wing parties have disappeared nearly, uh, they don't see a, an opportunity to be in the opposition than, else than being in the uh, in support of Marine Le Pen. And this is why Marine Le Pen, even though she's far right, has played a rather only populist, if you see what I mean, uh, card, trying to project that she's not far right. But if she would show her own uh, a real uh, far right position, she wouldn't have this level. So my take is that in, term, in terms of structural political forces, the far right has not progressed in five years, and we're still at 20% roughly. Yeah, well, we need to look at uh, institutions, uh, you know, not just the individuals uh, in a country's presidential or parliamentary elections. Thurston, do you have anything to add? Well, I would say I look more historically now, uh, and I think if you compare uh, France with Germany, uh, uh, even the UK, uh, you see, this is uh, what like Germany has done in terms of structural reform, and we know this has not been pushed through in France. And I think that this is still lingering, and um, and uh, and you could see it, it erupted in the Yellow West uh, um, uh, demonstrations and rage, uh, and uh, and these uh, you know the the, the the Yellow West campaigners that were behind that, there is kind of a little bit of marginal support for the political left. Uh, uh, in this campaign uh, because they see that there is a little bit of a moderate approach here which would uh, kind of compromise those values, uh, those anti, still anti-establishment, uh, 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 pro-labor, etc. Uh, values that was been, has been pushed through. So uh, that, I would add, that I would, could just add that there's still some form of reform, some bringing it from the 20th century into the 21st century uh, I think this is uh, still ahead of France, uh, and uh, it's questionable whether this election, uh, whoever wins it, uh, will, uh, is able to tackle that issue. Uh, Song Xin, what do you think? Well, uh, to be honest, I think it would um, be a disaster, actually, for both France and uh, for the European Union if uh, Marine Le Pen finally wins and becomes, therefore, the first uh, uh, French female president. Um, it will cause like uh, damage not only to the political uh, but also the economical uh, structure of the EU um, because uh, it is not the lack of um, a continuity because Marine Le Pen just represents a very very different proposition on all these issues. I'm not saying like she's going to jeopardize um, every like EU projects, but she's going to make it very very difficult when it comes to coordination at the EU level. She's not a person who is. Uh, willing to make any compromise when it comes to very um, like core you know issues for France, such as a um, um, uh, 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 unified army for the EU or for the EU budget, um, things like this. So I think it's going to be uh, tough if she finally wins. You know there are so many other issues at stake. Uh, let's talk about climate change, Joe. Though f the French are concerned about climate change, uh, they made no secret about it. Former Greenpeace campaigner Yannick uh, Jadot doesn't seem to be doing well. This candidate from the Europe uh, Ecology, the Greens, uh, has about 5-6% of support in the polls. Is climate not a strong factor as previously thought? No, it is a strong factor. The paradox is that for many elections, so there, there, there is a paradox for the Green Party because their ecological agenda has been gradually absorbed by other parties. One can, you know, discuss with more or less emphasis, but uh, 
most of the serious candidates integrate that. Jean-Luc Mélenchon integrates that. Uh, Emmanuel Macron integrates it. Uh, he can be criticized for not having been fast enough or whatever. People will always criticize. But the green agenda, so to speak, the ecological dimension, is integrated by other candidates. The green have lost the monopoly. Now, the green have made the strategic choice to have what they call uh, political ecology, where they want to be aggressive, aggressive in the English sense of the term, like proactive, in having social reforms where they accompany some sorts of measures which are, I would say, not just pro-people, but which uh, are radical in terms of how the society is organized, in terms of labor, in terms of finance, and etc. And according to me, they've gone a step too far, especially as they haven't been able to uh, do pedagogy with the people. And Jadot is exemplary of that. Jadot is someone who is disconnected to the people. He's not a kind of guy who can uh, transmit the messages. We have strong ecologists. Pascal Confin is the head of the ecologist at the European Parliament, Something, someone who's more who's softer, who's more pedagogical. So the green, uh, I've had a strategic position which they can't stick to, but uh, the climate change is very much uh, a, a concern for, for, the, for the French electorate. And uh, again, the, the robust electorate, what I call the robust electorates, which are not, you know, uh, fling sweeps, uh, uh, again, for Macron and Mélenchon, they have integrated this in their choices for those mm -hmm. two candidates. You know, there's one more angle I would like to explore, and it is China. China is the seventh largest buyer of French goods and the second largest seller to France. The two-way investment and trade have been booming. And it's very interesting to note that France did not join other Western countries in the boycotting the Beijing uh, 2022 Winter Olympics. Um, President Emmanuel Macron said this, actually. He's, he said, I want to believe that China will be consistent with its vision of territorial sovereignty and continue to seek to stop the war, referring to China's position on the Ukraine crisis. Thorsten, how do you see the presidential election affecting France-China relations? Well, I love this uh, quote. I want to uh, believe that China is consistent with its vision of territorial sovereignty and continue to seek to stop this war. If President Emmanuel Macron says that, that he wants to believe that, it also means that he doesn't fully believe that. And he's, I think, expecting some signals from China. And I think it's courageous at this point in time that at the time of election, he still keeps an open door policy to China. And it shows that the West is not so much of a unified front for something or against something. France wants to have its own singular position vis-a-vis -vis China. And I think it's a good development and it's an extended head to Chinese leaders to keep the discussion going on, on, on this war in Ukraine. We have about 30 seconds left. Thorsten, what do you think? I think it's a little bit speculative. So maybe it's not so important for the French to have a very strong anti-China sentiment as in other European countries or in the uh, EU level. Second is, you know, he invented the strategic autonomy or he made it popular, popularized it. Uh, so it could be that you have a little bit of slight nuance towards like the United States, NATO and the EU uh, having a little bit of a different angle uh, in this conversation about China. And uh, maybe third is, uh, maybe it's just realistic, right? So, uh, and he knows that actually China has no interest in that war uh, and has uh, interest uh, that this war ends because it's, it's doing good for no one. It's not doing good also. It's a big humanitarian crisis and it uh, interrupts mm -hmm. the trade. Uh, we have inflation issues, etc. So All right, guys. Uh, we'll I have think to that's, stop that's there, Thorsten, thank I you think. very much. Song Xin and Joe, thank you for joining us and being part of this discussion. And thank you for watching The Hub on CGTN. I'm Wang Guan. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.